Let's start. We're going to sing the books of the New Testament, okay? You ready? Maybe. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's in a letter to the Romans. First and second Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, Hebrews, James, first and second Peter, first and second and third John, Jude, and Revelation. All right, who can tell me what we call the first four books of that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What are those called? What are we called? The Gospels. All right, what are the Acts of? That's exactly what I'm asking you. The Acts of what? You're not going to lawyer your way out of this one. Acts of what? What is in the book of Acts? Huh? Jesus, very, very little at the very beginning. What do the books of Acts cover? What, do, what are we able to see? Kind of. Who? The apostles, what did the apostles do? Well, they followed Jesus, but they also, in the book of Acts, we find out what? Things they did within the church, right? We have, what else do we have? We have the church established, right? What are the other, let's see, going through here, the next... Uh, 21 books or so. What are those called? We call those a certain thing. It starts with an E. Epistle. I knew I was going to get that. Grace y'all are not catching up with that. Epistle. What's that name? A letter. Have any of you ever written a letter to someone? Who have you written a letter to, Avery? Huh? Oh, Miss Diane? Okay. No. You wrote a letter to Brian? <laughs> what, you ever written a letter to someone? Never? Not even Santa Claus? What, you? You written a letter to anyone? What about signing your footprint to something? You ever signed your footprint to something? So those are letters to what? Letters to, we call it a, letters to the, if we think about our 17 periods of Bible history, we got letters to, letters to Christians, they're letters to the churches in all those different places. The churches in Galatia, the church at Corinth, the church at Rome, Thessalonica, Ephesus, not this one. And then there was, uh, some of them were individuals, Timothy, Titus, Philemon. So we have to think there were letters to individuals too. So they're all throughout the New Testament we can find things to learn and do, right? In general through the Bible. What about in the Old Testament? Who, who was the... Uh, were they have, did they have letters to Christians in the Old Testament? No. Did they have the Acts of the Apostles in the Old Testament? What did they have? They had Moses, that's right. Who were the... <laughs> you have to explain that one to me. Huh? Maybe. Prophecies of Jesus, of his coming, of the Messiah. 
Well, in the Old Testament, there's not letters to Christians. There's no Acts of the Apostles. There's no uh, called Gospels. Why? It was before all that. It was before who? Jesus. So the only thing that could be there about Jesus is what? Prophecies about Jesus. Very good. So when we look at those prophecies, who would make a prophecy? What are those people called? Prophet. Very good. All right. So if we have a prophet and they were able to deliver prophecies, how, how do you know it's a foretelling of events to come? So throughout there was always prophets. And I guess if you want to, it's not exactly, it's not the same. It's not, not exactly, they're not the same. But it's a close relation to it. If you had the prophet, and you think about like the apostles and what their mission and goal was, which was to spread the good news of the gospel, the prophet's mission and goal was to say the thing about God. And what the children of Israel needed to do, or what they needed to stop doing in order to make God happy. Does that kind of make sense? So we have two different types of prophets in our Bible. They're called the what? There's five of one kind and twelve of another. Those prophets, yeah. Let me give you a hint. Twelve of them is little bitty. And five of them is big. And not in order of importance, just in the size of the world. Now, yeah, five what prophets and twelve what prophets? No, the twelve prophets were little b. They were. What if I help you out? What if I tell you the five were? We call them major prophets. So the other twelve were called minor prophets. Okay. And all those reign through the years in our Bible history of what? Do you know where they fall in our years of Bible history? In the what? Alright. Not the patriarchs. It's after that. It's no, way past that. Kingdoms. Okay. Mainly they really start to pick up in the divided kingdom and Judah alone, captivity, and then the return and reveal. Did any of them write during the 400 years of silence? Very good. I was thought you might be able to get a trick question out there. Try to be smart. So yeah, it won't mean anything in the 400 years of silence because it wasn't silent. You know, they were talking. So when we think about that, we can find our place for all our prophets to be. So we're going to start deciphering out some of our prophets, okay? You got it? And then Lawson's going to roll through the books of the Old Testament, the minor prophets. We're going to focus in on those at the end of it, okay? Let's, uh, let's sing a couple of songs real quick. Ready? And let's sing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Alright, come over, we'll get wrapped up, time to think. Ready? I'm wrapped up, I'm tied up, I'm taken up in Jesus, I'm wrapped up, I'm tied up, I'm taken up in God. I'm wrapped up, I'm tied up, I'm taken up in Jesus, I'm wrapped up, tied up, taken up in God. Shine. This light of mine.
Jesus, unwrap the title, thank you, Lord, thank God. Glad to see everybody out this evening. If you're joining us online, we're thankful for that as well. Our first song this evening will be number 118. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse of this song. After this song, uh, Brother Dwight McNabb will lead us in our opening prayer. When upon life's billows you are tempest falls, when you are discouraged, beautiful day that you bless us with. Thank you for the beautiful sunshine and the good rains you've given us lately. The whole blessings you've given us. Help us to be good stewards for the blessings you give us each day and always use it for the glorifying of your precious name and the precious name of your Son, our Lord Jesus that was sacrificed on the cross. Thank you, Father, for that sacrifice. We know, Father, that you accepted that sacrifice because you raised him up on the third day. 
Thank you, Father, for each family here this evening and each person. We pray your richest blessings on each home here. Help us each stray to strive to do what's pleasing in your sight. We know, Father, that sometimes we leave things undone that we should do and do things that we should. And we ask your forgiveness of all the signs. Father, we ask your blessings on our country, our local and state governments, our uh, national governments, our president. Give them wisdom in their decisions that they may enact laws that will help our country to be more godly in the future than it has been in the past. Father, bless the speaker of the hour and give him a good recollection of the things he's prepared and speak them in a way that we as students can understand. Help us as students, if we find the teachings to be the truth, we will act them out in our daily lives. Continue with us now through this worship, all through future life. When we've come to the end of life's way, for your grace and mercy, give us a home in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Six hundred eighty four. This world is not my home, I am just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't lay home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you.
good indeed to be with you this evening. Appreciate your presence. Appreciate those that join us online as well. I'd like for us this evening to think about a verse that's found in the book of 2 Corinthians. And there we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, Paul says, walking by faith and not by sight. And as I think about that verse, I, I read it, and then I began to look at it, and I thought, now what is it that Paul is saying here, and how do we do that? How do we walk by faith and not by sight? It's just that much is all the verse, just for we walk by faith and not by sight. But as you look at the context of this verse, what Paul is talking about, that we live on this earth, in a temporary tent, he calls it. We have these temporary bodies. And they're just here for a little while. But he says we, we as Christians live in anticipation of being immortal, living forever. Being with God in eternity. And he says we can do that because we have been reconciled to God. Now, the idea of being reconciled means that we've got this something between us, and, and when people are reconciled, uh, if Rhett and I get into some kind of dispute and we've got this hard thing going on between us, and we say, okay, we need to reconcile our differences. We get together and we talk it out, and maybe he gives a little and I give a little, and we say, okay, now, we, now we've got it all worked out, and we're good friends again, everything's good. So we reconciled with each other. But the fact is, in the Bible, it's always we are reconciled to God. God doesn't move. He doesn't change. We're the ones that have to change. But God is the one who actually does the reconciling to make it happen. And so He gives us the way in which we can reconcile. In verses 18 and 19, He says, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ. So what Christ did for us allows us to be reconciled to God. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not counting their trespasses against him. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And so Paul is saying that through what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection, we can be reconciled to God. And so he says, because we have been reconciled to God, we have been made righteous to God, by God, through Christ. And so God counts us as being righteous. Now, being righteous means that we're totally free from sin. So because God has reconciled us to himself through Christ, then we are counted as righteous. We're counted as though we had never committed a sin in our life. Look at verse 21. He that is God made him, that is Jesus Christ, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So in Jesus Christ, our sins are completely forgiven and because of that, then we are, are counted as righteous. We have been reconciled with God. And then he says, because we have been reconciled, because we're counted righteous, we've been given the Holy Spirit as a pledge or a guarantee that we will have this new body and that we will live with God in eternity. And so when Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight, he's saying that we are living in anticipation of that eternal home because of what God has done for us. Look at verses 5 through 7. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge, therefore being always of good courage, knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So Paul is saying, okay, God has worked all of this out for us, and now we live by faith. But what is that? <laughs> What does Paul mean? When Paul says that we walk by faith and not by sight, what does he mean by the word faith? The word faith in its most basic form just means absolute 
trust. And in this context, it's trust in God, trust in Jesus Christ. And so we live our lives in, in trusting, absolutely trusting God. If you go over to Hebrews chapter 11, in the chapter where he talks about uh, men and women of faith, he begins that chapter saying, Now faith is the sub assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. And then he gives an example of this, of the creation, in verse 3. And there he says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. In other words, by faith, we believe that God just spoke, and out of absolutely nothing, made everything. That's faith. He said that's what faith is all about. Faith is trust in God. We are totally convinced that God did create everything. And then he gives some illustrations of faith by different people. We're going to look at just a couple of them. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Abraham, by faith, built an ark. Now, why did it take faith for Abraham to build an ark? A lot of reasons. <laughs> I'll tell you a lot of reasons. Number one, it was based on the promise that God made Abraham that the, there's going to come a flood. It's going to rain and there's going to be this huge flood and it's going to cover all the world. Yeah. No, I'm saying Abraham stood in no, Noah. Abraham didn't build an ark. <laughs> Noah built an ark. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, so Noah, we'll get to Abraham next. Noah is told by God, it's going to rain. And based on what we know about the Bible, probably Noah's first question is, what's rain? Because there's absolutely no indication it had ever rained before because it says that God watered the earth with a mist, with a dew. And then he says, okay, it's going to rain. Let me tell you, rains this water, is going to come out of the sky and it's going to be so much water that it's going to flood everything. So I want you to build this boat. Now, to get it in our perspective, it's one and a half times the length of a football field. That's a big boat. And the best we can determine, it took Noah somewhere around 100 years to build this boat. And unless people have changed a whole lot, Mo uh, Moses, Moses didn't build a boat, did he? Noah did. I'm going to get it right in a minute. Noah built this boat. But unless things have changed a whole lot, Noah endured an awful lot of abuse from all of the people around him for that hundred years he was building that boat. Can you imagine what these people were saying when he starts building? They say, what are you doing? He said, I'm building this big boat. They said, why? They said, because it's going to rain. They said, What's that? You really believe that? You, you really believe? You, I mean, how ridiculous can you get? And yet for uh, about 100 years, he kept building, kept building, kept building. Finally, he did. The flood came, and Noah and his family were saved by faith. He trusted God. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Look at verse 19. He considered that God is able to raise men from the dead from which also he received him back as type. God said, I want you to kill your son and burn him on an altar. Abraham took him early in the morning the very next day, carried him up to the mountain, tied him up, put him on the altar, took his knife and was fixing to stab him to kill him, and God stopped him. And God said, I know if you'll do that, you'll do anything. But you know what his faith was based on? It was based on reason. God had promised him that through your son Isaac, I'm going to make a great nation of people. Now, Abraham was 100. His wife Sarah was 90 when Isaac was born. And Abraham reasoned, if he can give us a kid when we're this old and Sarah's way past the age of bearing children, 
And God allowed her to get pregnant, just like he promised. And God gave us this son. Then if I kill him, God says he's going to make a great nation of people out of him, so he'll raise him from the dead. So it's not going to hurt anything if I kill him. But how much faith does it take to kill your only son, your special favorite son, believing that God will raise him from the dead? That's faith. That's trusting God. So Abraham is a demonstration of that kind of faith, trusting God. Faith is absolute trust in God. So how do we get this kind of trust in God? Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. If we want to get faith, we've got to study the Bible. That's the only way we're going to get it. Study the Bible. Faith is also used in a sense of meaning the body of teaching revealed by Christ and by his apostles and by his disciples. In Jude, verse 3, it's just one chapter. In verse 3, Jude says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, this is the body of teaching that was revealed by inspiration to the men who wrote it down, and which is what we call the Bible. In 2 Peter 1.21, Peter says, No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So what we have revealed to us about God and about how we can serve God and how we can be made righteous and how we can have eternal life, all of that, that whole body of teaching is referred to by Jude as the faith. And so we walk by that faith. That is the faith that has been revealed to us. And so for us to know this faith that's been delivered, we have to study the Scriptures. We have to study the Bible. We have to study the Word of God. In 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, Be diligent. King James says, Study. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. Study the word of truth. Try to understand it. Try to put it together. And as we understand it, then we put it into practice in our lives. So faith in the context of Jude, this body of teaching, is referring to the grace of God as revealed in Jesus. Now, if you look at verse 4 of the, this verse, the very next verse, he says, I've delivered this to you. We have this faith. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, licentiousness is not a word that we use very often. But what that word means is a license to do something. And so there were those who came along then, and there are some even today who teach the same thing, that says since God saves us by His grace, then it really doesn't matter how we live. In fact, God's grace gives us a license to sin. And some even argued that Paul was teaching that since God saves us by grace, then the more we sin, the more God forgives us, and the more God forgives us, the better God is. Because that makes His grace even greater. So if you really want to make God look good, just keep on sinning. Do everything you want to do. And so Paul says, that ain't true. That's not the way it is. So for us to walk by faith, we need to understand the grace of God and how it applies to us. Grace is not license to sin. Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The New American Standard says, May it never be. King James says, God forbid. Absolutely not, one translation says. He says, don't you know that the one that we serve, we become slaves to, either sin or righteousness? 
We become a new person in Jesus Christ. We've been baptized into Christ. We've been raised to walk in newness of life. We put to death sin, and we don't live any in sin anymore. God's grace gives us freedom to live for Him, not freedom to sin. We put our trust and our faith in Jesus and what He has done for us, not what we can do for ourselves. And this is what the grace of God is about. It's putting our trust in God, putting our trust in Jesus, and not putting it in ourselves. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul there talking about the gospel, he said, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That is the essence of the grace of God. That's what Jesus did for us. He died for our sins, he was buried and he was raised again. And it is because of that we have God's grace. So grace means that God forgives our sins and makes us righteous even though we don't deserve it. And this is, goes back to the verse we read just a while ago, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is grace. And this grace delivers us from sin. But it also teaches us not to sin anymore. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because they viewed themselves as righteous on their own. In fact, they trusted in themselves to be right with God instead of trusting in God to make them right. They thought somehow they could do enough good things that God would owe it to them to save them. Look at Luke 18 and verse 9. Jesus told a parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. And the parable that he tells is when the Pharisee went up to the temple to pray and he said, I thank God that I'm not like other men. I fast and I tithe and I do all these wonderful deeds and I'm not like that sinner over there. And that sinner was a publican. And he says he wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he smote himself on the breast and he said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus said, that man went away to his house justified rather than that Pharisee. We have to put our trust in God and what Jesus has done for us, not what we can do for ourselves. It's no wonder then. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus said that our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. The question then for us is how can we know the grace of God? How can we know the faith or the body of teaching that's been revealed to us. Well, Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We have to study the Bible to know it. What is faith? Faith is absolute trust in God. Faith is the body of teaching that's been revealed to us by Christ. And faith is what we believe to be right or wrong. That is our conscience our own personal conviction. In Romans chapter 14, Paul says there beginning verse 22, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. Paul is saying here, if you violate your conscience in doing something, then that's sin. Whatever you believe to be right, you've got to do it. Whatever you believe to be wrong, you've got to refrain from doing it. You've got to make sure that you do what your conscience tells you to do. And he says, if you're not doing that, then what you're doing is not from faith. But just because we believe something to be right doesn't make it right. And at the same time, just because we think something's wrong doesn't make it wrong. We may be mixed up in our thinking. Our conscience may not be trained properly. We have, may have been taught all through our life something that is not correct. And so just because we believe it does not make it right, it does not make it wrong. 
But we must do what we believe is right. And leave off what we believe to be wrong. The reality in life is that no matter how much we want to do what's right, no matter how much we study God's Word and try to understand it the very best we possibly can, we're going to have times that we just don't agree with somebody else that's just as sincere as we are and trying just as hard as we are to do what's right about what's right and wrong. We're going to have disagreements. And those things are going to come. And so here in Romans 14, Paul is not talking about just matters of indifference for all my life. I've heard preachers say, well, Romans 14 is talking about matters of indifference, things that don't really make any difference. You can just do it or not do it. It doesn't matter. That is not what Paul's talking about. And if you read it, read it in the context, you see that that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about things that are just matters of indifference that are neither right nor wrong in themselves. Look at verse 5 and 6. One man regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. That is, some people think there are certain special days that you need to observe in order to be right with God. Now, I may believe that, and Vernon doesn't. So he says, one man does, another man doesn't. Then look what he says. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. That is, Vernon thinks he ought not to do it. He ought to be convinced not to do it. I believe I should. I ought to be convinced that I do. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. That's me doing it. He who eats does so for the Lord. For he who gives thanks to God, he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. All of this, he's talking about our being right with God and doing what pleases God. And what he's saying is that we must keep our conscience. We have to do what we believe to be right. Look at verse 14. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. I'll give you a real good illustration of that. Man had been a Jew all of his life. He's been told all of his life that he cannot eat pork, and it's wrong to eat pork, and God forbids it. And he becomes a Christian. You think the next day he's going to go out and order pork chops? No, he's not going to because in his mind it's wrong to eat pork. He may come to the realization one day that it's okay. But the fact is, as long as he thinks it's wrong, Paul says he ought not to eat it. Because to him it would be wrong. In fact, Paul goes one step farther. He says, if I go out with him and my eating pork will encourage him to do it and violate his conscience, then I need to not eat it either. Because I don't want to encourage him to do what he believes to be wrong, even though I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And so we need to look for what builds up and not do anything that would tear down our brother. But somebody says, well, wait a minute. Truth is absolute. God has revealed the faith once for all, delivered to the saints, and it's truth. And truth is absolute. God doesn't make any mistakes. He doesn't change. Truth is truth. It's always truth. It's absolute. And you know what I'd say to that? Amen. It is. Truth is always true. But what sometimes we forget is that our understanding of truth is not absolute. Sometimes we're wrong. We've all been wrong at times. I was wrong a while ago, Vernon straightened me out. When I had Abraham building an ark. That ain't right. You see, we all at times are wrong. So how can we be wrong about something and still be right with God? And this is a question that a lot of people have a hard time with because they think, well, if you're not right about everything that you believe, then there's no way that you can be right with God because you believe things that are not right and you're practicing something that's not right. How are you going to be right with God? I'll tell you how, by grace. That's what grace is. It's forgiving us when we don't deserve to be forgiven. It's reconciling us when we don't deserve to be reconciled. 
It's making us righteous by what Jesus did for us, not what we've done ourselves. And when I begin to think that I have to be right on everything and practice everything perfectly right in order for God to accept me, I have been begun to trust in myself rather than trusting in God. When we're walking by faith, we're walking in the light. When we're continually walking in the light, our sins are continually being forgiven. That's what John says in 1 John chapter 1, beginning verse 5. This is the message we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light in him. There's no darkness of all at all. If we say we have no sin, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. And I've heard people explain this by saying walking in the light means that we're doing everything right. But if walking in the light means that we're doing everything right, then why does He continue to forgive our sins? You see, walking in the light means I'm trying to do everything right. I'm living for Him the best I know how. I'm putting everything I can into learning about it and practicing it and living it in my life. But even still, I recognize that I still do wrong. I still mess up. And by God's grace, the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse me. And so Paul says in Romans chapter 7 and 8, that even though we mess up, God still loves us. He still forgives us. In chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He counts us as righteous by grace. But how do we train our conscience to know the truth? You see, yes... Living by faith and walking by faith means that we do what we understand to be right. We leave off what we understand to be wrong. So we need to train our conscience then to be aligned with God's perfect truth. How do we do that? Paul says in Romans 10, 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We study God's word. We continue to learn. We put it into practice the best we know how. And we live for Him every day. That's what walking by faith is all about. Walking by faith and not by sight. This evening, are you walking by faith? If not, you can put your trust in God and in Jesus Christ and you can begin your walk with Him now by becoming a Christian and, and living for Him. If you're already a Christian and your life is not right and you've not been living by faith, you can come to Him and ask Him to forgive you. He's promised He will. And He'll continue to forgive you. You'll continue to be right with Him. If you're here and you're subject to the invitation this evening, we invite you to come if we stand as we sing.
Are there those here this evening that have not had a chance to partake of the Lord's Supper? If you will, please raise your hand. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you now giving thanks for this um, bread, which to us Christians represents the body of Christ that was put on the cross of Calvary. And we pray that you will be with us at this time as we partake of it, that we will do so in a, a pleasing manner in your sight. And in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Let us bow again. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you again giving thanks for the fruit of the vine to us Christians, which represents the blood that was uh, so shed on the cross. And we pray that you will help us to think back to the cross and that your blood heals us. And without it, um, we would have no hope of heaven. And help us to do so in a well-pleasing manner in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight and singing out. Uh, I'd like to thank Brother Robert for a good lesson tonight. Are there any other announcements before we dismiss? If not, Brother Matt will lead us in our closing prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day and everything that you have blessed us with. Lord, we pray that you will help us, to strengthen us, that we could walk our faith every day. Lord, we pray that we face, as we face adversity, that you will give us the strength to overcome, that we will always look to you for the guiding light in the dark world. Father, we pray that you'll be with those who are sick and restore them back to the daily walks of life. Please be with those who are waiting procedures and diagnoses and plans of action. Father, we pray that you will comfort them and do with the doctors that are tending to them. Lord, we pray that you will forgive us of our sins and we pray that we will repent of them, give us the strength to find that way of escape when we are tempted. We pray all this in Christ's name.